So I'll start. Hi, welcome. My name is Dr. Stephanie Gripney. This is Impact Finance Center. and We are in partnership with Essex County Community Foundation and Gilson Family Foundation to present to you our first webinar of Arts, Culture, and Creative Economy webinar today. And um, I'm thrilled to introduce our partners um, with this who are gonna um, co-moderate the session today. We have Stratton Lloyd, Executive Vice President and CEO of Essex County Community Foundation. And we also have Karen um, Restubin, Program Director <laughs> of the Creative County Initiative. Karen, I hope I got your last name right. So um, you can correct me. Restubin, <laughs> Restubin. I just realized I had not pronounced that yet. Um, from that perspective. Um, so a couple of things, if you're new here, new to us, if you signed up for this webinar, you will receive a link to the recording on the Impact Investing Institute. We ask everybody, please mute yourselves while we're doing the presentation so, um, so that we can hear our speakers. Um, for those of you who donated, Impact Finance Center is a nonprofit and we, uh, we appreciate your donation and uh, we are super excited to do this. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Stratton and Karen, and they are going to moderate our session today um, with our illustrious speakers. Terrific, and I'll, I'll just say a quick hello. Um, you know, uh, Stratton Lloyd with the Essex County Community Foundation. Um, I think I've met a lot of you all, but not all of you. And uh, so uh, I look forward to doing that in person too over time. Um, and the Community Foundation is on this journey, and we're asking the big question, which is what is the role of the Community Foundation in inspiring local impact investing? And how can we capitalize or better utilize charitable assets in the region and outside the region and across the nation to further the mission um, and goals of our nonprofit organizations in our communities in the region? And can we tap into that bigger corpus of assets um, and align that with, you know, the community goals and the grant making and the work that's happening to, um, you know, build a better, stronger, more resilient community uh, over time? And so we've been asking that question. We've been on this journey for a while. Some of you all have been with us on this journey um, as we've, you know, gathered information and and. We are really starting to accelerate that work over the next few months and a variety of wonderful training and learning opportunities. And so we're super excited for you all to participate in that learning with us. Um, and this is a this is uh, this is bi-directional. We you know we're learning too. If you have ideas or thoughts or questions, please reach out to us at any point. Um, uh, we're doing a bunch of different things. So if you're confused by some of those, we apologize. That's that's not due to lack of desire to be um, clear and simple. It's more from a place of, hey, we want to do a lot and we're, we're doing a lot over now and then again in May, which we'll, we'll probably talk about more at the end of this conversation, which are some in-person workshops that'll be happening in May that you'll be hearing from us about. But, um, you know, we are, we are super excited about this. We are committed as an organization. The board is committed uh, to uh, defining our role in this space. Um, and really trying to inspire more impact investing locally. And this is one of the core areas, arts and culture is one of the core areas that we're just starting to explore. Um, but we're also thinking about housing, small businesses, environmental lending, a variety of other places that could be beneficial to our nonprofits and what we've learned in our research to date from our community and from our nonprofit. So we're super excited today to really talk about arts and culture specifically, but it's really an, an example more than just a sole focus, it's more of an example of how impact investing in, in a lot of different domains can be super effective and successful and aligned um, with the grant making and, and, uh, and, and mission work that we're doing across the community um, as a whole. So um, it, super excited it, to have everybody here. Um, please ask questions in the chat or engage. And um, we look forward to a, a good dialogue today. And Stratton, just to um, further, I just want to do uh, two things just to give people a little bit of context, like uh, Impact Finance Center is based in Denver, Colorado. How did we get in partnership with Essex County Community Foundation? And so for those of you who are new to us, we help uh, individuals, foundations, private community foundations, 
family offices and companies figure out how to go in there, start their impact investing journey. You can think of us as an investor accelerator, and we try to help you do your first three steps. And in some cases, we help with the strategic, strategic plan. And I just want to share the slide, Stratton, just to emphasize your point of, of what happened is we um, had the great fortune to uh, educate and activate Gilson Family Foundation on their impact investing journey. And they said, can you bring, you have Colorado Impact Days, who's who in impact investing, all this really fun stuff. Can you bring any of this to Massachusetts? And, and we said, are you willing to also give grants to community foundations to actually help them with their strategic plans? And so as uh, Stratton was saying, arts and culture is first, but not last of what we're going to do. So we worked with Essex over the last two years, year and a half, Stratton. Yeah, and, yeah. and really, and, you know, walking through helped you figure out your demand, focusing first on nonprofits, intermediaries, enabling environment and supply of capital, and, and kind of went through the strategic journey with you. And this year we're actually like, Hey, Gilson, give us resources to help us implement. So we're super excited that they've done this. And this is kind of the first step of our implementation process. Anything else you want to say, Stratton? No, that's perfect. Yeah, no, I mean, it's definitely a great partnership and we're, we're appreciative to have the, not only the intelligence, but also the bandwidth <laughs> to do some of this work um, as we really want to do it thoughtfully and we want to do it with a systems mindset, which is how we approach all of our community leadership work and the work that we're doing. Um, and and as, as many of you all know, we've done a lot of ecosystem building and systems work in arts and culture um, over the last many years, and Karen has led that charge. And so I think that's why we're specifically talking about place-based impact investing in the domain of arts and culture and what does that look like to think about. But again, this could be extended to many different areas. So I think that's you a good it. transition, you know, back it to is. where we are. Um, and, uh, and, um, and, and, you know, this has been a journey that we've been working with, you know, the Bar Foundation on for a long time, um, who has supported this work and is a real partner in this work um, that we're super thankful for. And we have a bunch of great bar folks on the call today, which we love. Um, and, uh, we are continuing that journey with them, in particular around place-based impact investing. So I'll hand Fantastic. it over to Karen. Are you ready, Karen, to sort of- We were. I'm going I'm to go with Karen yeah. along yeah. the way, Stratton. Yeah. So I'll uh, I'll tee Karen up. Karen, right, <laughs> tell us a little bit about who you are and what your role is at Essex County Community Foundation. And with that, um, the next thing will be, like, why don't you uh, take the time to introduce us to our, our, our esteemed panel? Sure thing. Uh, so I'm Karen Ristabin. I'm the program director for uh, one of the initiatives under Essex County Community Foundation, which is the Creative County Initiative. It's um, their investment in arts and culture in our 34 community region uh, of Essex County. Um, I've been in this uh, position for seven years now, and we've been doing a host of things, including grant making, uh, lots of convenings of people uh, across the county, um, leadership development, um, and and you know, uh, just providing resources in a, as, as Stratton said, in a more uh, systematic and systems-based way uh, across the county, uh, trying to connect people and organizations and sectors uh, to so that it's a stronger arts and culture uh, community across our region. This work, uh, I was inspired by um, a, a Grant Makers in the Arts Conference back in 2018 that I went to, or 2019 maybe, in Oakland. And um, Ambitious um, was there, one of our uh, organizations that, that you'll be hearing from today. And, um, and it was part of this uh, Community Arts Stabilization Trust. And there was a presentation about this work out there. And I came back to Essex County, and I said, can we do that? Can we do what they're doing there? Which was basically stabilizing real estate for creatives and cultural organizations and cultural groups and working with them as well to uh, eventually own uh, real estate and um, build their capacity, strengthen their capacity to do so. So uh, it's a wonderful model. And um, I think with that, we can just dive right in here as uh yeah, uh, that's about all I have to say. It's it's I'm super excited to be uh, getting into this work. Fantastic. So, um, Laura, um, please come up to the stage and introduce our, introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about your journey to becoming the founder and who you are and and what Upstart Collab does. Great, happy to. Uh, my name's Laura Callanan. I'm the founding partner at Upstart Collab. 
Upstart connects capital to creative people who make a profit and make a difference. We are a nonprofit working at the intersection of impact investing and the creative economy. Uh, I can tell you a little bit more about Upstart's work, but let me uh, answer the question about myself and how we got to launch Upstart in uh, 2016. Immediately before launching Upstart CoLab, I was the senior deputy chair at your federal arts agency, the National Endowment for the Arts. And uh, when I was there in the Obama administration, the budget for the NEA was about $150 million a year. So this is the US. We know that government's not our major funder of arts and culture, but philanthropy does a great job. And so there's about $20 billion a year of philanthropic capital that supports arts and culture. So that's great, right? We just went from millions to billions. Earlier in my career as the Deputy Chief Investment Officer at the Rockefeller Foundation, about 25 years ago, I started working in impact investing. It wasn't even called that at the time, but the foundation was looking to explore how it could use some of its capital uh, to support the same sorts of values and topics and programmatic areas that it typically supported through grants. So we took about $25 million and we invested it across the four program areas of the foundation, which included creativity and culture. So there I was sitting at the National Endowment for the Arts at a time when the uh, capital in the United States that was thinking about doing well financially and doing good in the world was in the trillions of dollars. And I was thinking, how could the creative sector break off a little tiny crumb of this multi-trillion dollar number to complement government support and philanthropic capital that already cares about what's happening in art, design, culture, heritage, and creativity. So I began to think about this and explore it at the NEA. I left Washington, came back to New York uh, with the support of five key foundations, launched Upstart, and um, got to meet Gary very early in the Upstart Collab journey. Um, but what we've been doing is a couple of things. We've been think looking at the creative economy is both a use of impact investing capital, investing in businesses that are in creative industries. That includes fashion, food, film and TV, video games, disruptions to the visual art market. There are 145 creative industries that make up the US creative economy. And so we've been looking for opportunities across that whole set of creative industries so that when uh, impact investors are enlightened and excited about supporting the work that can happen in creative industries and how creative places and businesses can anchor vibrant communities that we can point them in the right direction. We can connect uh, impact investing capital to these opportunities in the creative economy. At the same time, we've been looking to unlock the creative economy as a source of impact investing capital. By our count, there's about $64 billion sitting in the endowments of America's museums and art schools and performing arts centers and libraries, zoos, parks, all of our cultural institutions. And unlike the capital that sits with foundations like the Bonfi Stanton Foundation and sits with universities, uh, unfortunately, while we are thoughtful uh, and community-minded in the arts in many, many ways, arts organizations have been behind their nonprofit peers when thinking about how to align their endowment investments with their stated values and their mission. So Upstart's been trying to unlock that and educate cultural leaders about how they could put their money where their values are. Um, uh, I'm going to pause there. I'm sure we'll get to circle back we around. We will. We will have plenty of time to circle deeper back into it. And we want to introduce our next panelist, um, Kate Fox, Director of Ambitious Center for Creative Industries. Welcome. Thank you. Um, hello, good morning, and good afternoon, depending on what time zone you all are in. I'm Kate Fox. I use she, her pronouns. I am, oh, thanks, Alexis, for dropping the ambitious um, link in the chat. Appreciate that. Um, I am coming to you from what is a very gray Chicago um, and just really honored that Impact, um, Impact Finance Center and uh, invited us to be part of this. And always great to be in community with Laura uh, and Gary, who I've known for I was thinking about this over a decade. Thanks. Uh, but that's because we met in our team. Um, 
uh, I just, you know, just a little bit about my own personal journey, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, the Center for Cultural Innovation and Ambitious, which I'm the director of. Uh, I have had a wandering path. Um, I appreciated hearing Laura, who uh, had this very wonderful narrative about, you know, sort of the, the journey that she was on. Mine has definitely been a little, um, has been a little more uh, fits and starts. I started in the nonprofit sector, um, worked in a frontline organization, and became very passionate about systems change. Uh, because the things that I was seeing, um, I happened to work um, with folks that were unhoused. Uh, by the time I got to, to be with them and really be with them on their journey, it, it, we were so far down the way that things were not actually, the, the things that would really help them were so far upstream that I couldn't access them. And so I put myself on a journey to get to a systems change perspective, which meant I needed to learn how to fundraise. So I spent a few years as a development um, person and um, I decided that I really needed to understand the nonprofit structure as, as a, you know, as a vehicle for change. And so I became a consultant and spent years in strategic planning and fundraising and um, uh, culture change and all of that good stuff. And then I, got an opportunity, which was really incredible, which was to work at the MacArthur Foundation to, to be um, overseeing our arts and culture program. And that really provided me um, with a systems change perspective because it was very place-based in Chicago. Um, it was my first experience with impact investing, um, which was totally scary to me at the time. If, uh, if finance isn't your love language, you're not alone. Um, I definitely came from that perspective, but came to see it as a really incredible tool. And as I got deeper into um, the movement for uh, social justice and racial justice, um, I wanted to get even deeper into all the tools that we have um, in philanthropy as a potential for change and for systems change in particular. And artists and culture bearers are a, a key component of that. So I work for the Center for Cultural Innovation, with it, which is a nonprofit. It's an intermediary organization. We, um, in the ambitious uh, pooled fund, we are time limited. We hold funds from other amazing uh, foundations, including the Bar Foundation. And we act as research and development for philanthropy, really helping philanthropy um, explore new um, and maybe not so new structures to, um, to create the kind of change that they wanna see in the world. So that's a little bit about me. I love that journey. And I love the journey of um, understanding from all sides and the systems component to it. Really wonderful. Before I hand it over to Karen for the next round of questions, um, Gary, it's great to see you, even though we're probably literally about a half a mile away from one another. It's great to see you on Zoom. And um, tell us uh, tell us about your journey and, and how you got to Bonfi Stanton Foundation. Sure. Thanks, Steph, and glad to be here. As as Steph said, I'm 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 coming to you from Denver, Colorado, where the ski season is starting to come to an end. <laughs> we'll we'll shift into mountain biking and rafting and hiking and other wonderful uh, activities that you can do here. Um, so my path, um, I suppose, is also kind of a meandering one. My I, I began as an aide to a United States congressman, uh, handling arts issues, but also many, many other issues. Um, ran the Vineyard Theater in New York City. Um, as part of that, uh, also built a new theater for them, so did a major capital campaign. So I have this experience kind of in the trenches, uh, running arts organizations uh, as well. I was a commercial theater producer, so this intersection of for-profit arts, nonprofit arts, I. I raised uh, capital uh, from limited partners and and produced uh, shows commercially. Um, I was also the capital uh, funding director for the New York State Council on the Arts and actually created that program back in the late 80s. 
Um, so got very involved. Again, it's it's sort of an intersectional space, working with architects and engineers and uh, working on capital funding for cultural projects all over New York State. I ran National Actress Theater on Broadway, which was Tony Randall's uh, theater company uh, on Broadway. Um, and then uh, I was just reintroducing myself in chat to Jim Grace because I ran the National Arts and Business Council, uh, which was also the, our own kind of New York City chapter as well for about a dozen years. Um, again, working at the intersection of arts and business and the for-profit creative sector, the nonprofit sector, um, uh, working with a lot of, you know, Fortune 500 CEOs and companies, uh, then oversaw the merger of the Arts and Business Council with both Business Committee for the Arts and Americans for the Arts, uh, where I kind of started and ran the private sector division of Americans for the Arts for several years, and then became the chief cultural officer for the city of Philadelphia, where I ran the Office of Arts, Culture, and the Creative Economy. So again, this intersection of uh, the for-profit creative sector working to kind of foster a robust for-profit creative sector, music industry, art industry, uh, fashion, design, food, et cetera, uh, interacting uh, deeply with our commerce department and, you know, economic development initiatives. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, ended up in Denver. So uh, uh, running the Bonfi Stanton Foundation, I've been here since uh, 2013. Um, and that sort of coincided with the foundation, which has been around uh, technically uh, since the early 60s, but we really didn't start grant making uh, in a substantial way until the mid 80s. Um, we have a corpus of about, um, depending on the market and our grant making, uh, around 85, 90 million dollars. Um, so we're a small foundation. Um, you know, we're not we're not Mellon, we're not Rockefeller, we're not Ford, we're not Kresge, um, and we're place based. Um, so we really are focused in in Denver, although increasingly sort of Denver Metro as we apply an equity lens to our grant making. And Denver, like a, like a lot of cities, has this suburbanization of poverty challenge where because of the increasing lack of affordability in the core uh, center of Denver, more and more uh, people of color, poor folks are actually living in the suburban ring. So we've kind of expanded our geography to encompass the suburban ring in order to uh, kind of implement our equity values. And so I arrived at the foundation right at the point in time when the foundation had decided to shift 100% of its um, philanthropy to arts and culture. Um, and we also have a program that we run that that focuses on leadership, but our grant making is really focused on, on arts and culture. And so kind of the path towards impact investing uh, and and my early connection to Laura and her work was around the fact that as a place-based funder with a particular focus on arts and culture, as we began engaging in impact investing, we were really, I think, uh, at the kind of early edge of, of a movement towards saying, okay, how do we do this? You know, there are funds that are focused on environment and sustainability, funds that are focused on gender issues. Um, it was kind of easier to find investment opportunities in a lot of different other social areas of impact, but more challenging within arts and culture. And we'll get into how, our process and how we've kind of gone about that uh, later in this session, but I'll end here. Thank you, Gary. Karen, um, why don't you take us into round two? Sure thing. Yeah, thank you all uh, so much, too, for joining us today. Just want to give my personal thanks to all three of you uh, for, for taking your time. Um, we'd like to know about one investment, one impact investment that you've overseen, managed, your, your organization, your foundation has done in arts, culture, creative economy uh, in the sector. And tell us a little bit about it, just one, one example, and how uh, you've gone about it and try to um, incorporate some of the um, language, you know, around impact investing for those of us uh, on the call who may not be as familiar than as others um, uh, in impact investing and its terminology. So, uh, so let's start with um, let's start with Kate. Thank you. Um, sure. Would love to talk with you about one of our um, impact investments. Um, 
I'm going to pick East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative, um, which is in Oakland. Uh, and East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative is a really excellent example of how we think about the arts um, and culture, because it's a, it is a real estate cooperative, um, and its primary goal is to hold Black culture in, um, in the 7th Street business corridor, historically Black um, business corridor. And they have essentially created a whole economic system. So it isn't just um, it isn't just creating a cultural center. It's really using culture as um, a holding mechanism for a community, and they have really innovated with um, with recent um, with recent legislation in the 2012 Jobs Act. We're going to get a little nerdy on you in the 2012 Jobs Act. Um, there's a provision in there that allows for something called direct uh, public offerings. We're familiar with IPOs, right? Those are, those are um, for many of us, uh, just things that we hear about on the news that other people are able to invest in um, these initial public offerings of companies. Um, and most of us don't have millions sitting, you know, in our couch cushions, ready to pull out for, um, for these kinds of opportunities. But in the 2012 Jobs Act, it actually has a provision in there where, um, where folks like us um, actually have the ability to, uh, to make investments in local, um, in local public offerings. So um, East Pay East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative worked with um, the Sustainable Economy Law Center to make it possible for community members to purchase shares of the cooperative. And so that meant that for $1,000 a share, local community folks could, could own a piece of um, a, a cooperative that was purchasing real estate and then not only have that as a potential wealth building structure for them, but also participate in decision making um, in how what properties get acquired and how those properties get developed. So again, it, it wasn't even just about um, wasn't just about stabilizing a place. It was really embedding governance and um, and a voice in how communities are able to um, are able to develop, um, taking properties off of speculative markets. Um, so what Ambitious did was go in and also purchase for $1,000 a share, or, um, 100 shares of this uh, cooperative. And then we said, basically, we're not going to take dividends. We're returning the dividends to the community to continue to reinvest. Um, and we just did uh, in our last, and so we did that in, I think, 2021. And then we just did in 2023 um, an integrated capital investment, which meant that we provided operating support alongside another purchase of shares. <clears throat> and those shares and that money that they used, they were able to purchase uh, just uh, Esther's uh, Orbit Room, which is a really important jazz venue. It was the Harlem of the West. Um, and they're in the process of developing it with a, a ton of community input. And um, the way that uh, East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative gets people to vote and gets people involved really uses arts and culture as a bonding mechanism for community. Which that's a very complicated answer to your very simple question, <laughs> but I just wanted to give you a sense of it, it. It wasn't just an investment; it was actually a systems reimagining that put the community members at the center, and we just happened to be um, a, an additional supporter. That's awesome and and incredibly innovative thinking. Um, uh, Laura, can you give us an example? 
Sure, and I'm going to piggyback off what Kate was describing. So what Kate was talking about was one crowdfunding example. And so I just added to the chat a link to Honeycomb Credit, which was uh, which is a crowdfunding platform that Upstart Collab partnered with to help foundations, place-based investors, like a community foundation, to help foundations target investing in mom and pop brick and mortar businesses in creative industries within a designated geographic target area that was important to the foundations. So Upstart worked closely with the Honeycomb Credit team to develop a loan participation fund model where a foundation could put $250,000 or more onto the Honeycomb platform where Honeycomb has a, a a very thoughtful underwriting process. So if you are a for-profit business in a community, you run a bakery, you run a brewery, you run a floral shop, you run a hair salon. Uh, these are all in the creative industries. Uh, and this is what attracted Upstart to work with Honeycomb because about 90% of the companies on the Honeycomb platform borrowing money are in the creative industries. Uh, and you need money to expand your, your business, uh, you can borrow through the Honeycomb credit platform. 50% uh, of the borrowers who come to Honeycomb have been turned down by their local bank or by a, a community development finance institution or other natural lenders to small businesses. And so uh, this is uh, an alternative. It's sort of the capital one for small business lending in that uh, Honeycomb is very thoughtful about how to underwrite the loan to feel like it will be able to, you know, the, the companies will be able to pay back and the interest rate is an indication of the level of risk that the company represents as a borrower. So uh, what's, what's great about this for a foundation is they might want to work with some of the smaller businesses in their community, particularly businesses that are in a low-income community uh, that are led by women or BIPOC founders uh, for us that are in creative industries. And, but a foundation is not going to be able to manage $25,000, $10,000 loans to 25 small companies. Honeycomb is set up to be able to facilitate investing in these companies directly and to do it in small dollar amounts. So a, a place-based investor, a community foundation, a private foundation is able to work with Honeycomb, set the zip code priorities, set the industry priorities, identify the types of entrepreneurs they are most interested in supporting as aligned with their values. And then Honeycomb does all of the administration. So when there's a qualified campaign, uh, which means business coming on the platform seeking a loan, when there's a qualified campaign that meets the priorities that the foundation has established, uh, Honeycomb is able to match $10,000 of that foundation's funding to that particular business. Um, these are loans. The businesses are expected to, to pay them back. Uh, but for borrowers who need outside capital to grow their business, to buy equipment, to take a lease on a building, to hire more staff, um, and they're not able to qualify for a loan elsewhere, this can become a very, uh, a, a very good and useful alternative. So I'll stop there, but if we have another chance, I can talk about some opportunities working with community development finance institutions directly. Great. Yeah, we would definitely want to hear about CDFRs. Um, so Gary, what is your example for us? Well, it's a good segue. <laughs> um, yeah. So, and I just want to share a little bit of context, which is, you know, for us, impact investing in, and for, you know, any foundation or investor looking at this, it's a continuum. So, you know, you have at one end, pure philanthropy, um, where the outcome is all program related, in effect, all mission driven. And at the other end, pure investments, where the intent is market rate returns. And then you have kind of everything in between. So for us, we've been on this path of essentially shifting as much of our corpus as possible towards an impact lens um, in the broadest sense. So, you know, ESG screening, negative screening, positive screening, a thoughtful process around what are our values and how to, and, and then finding an investment firm, frankly, that can work on that and not all investment firms have that as a skill set. 
and and finding one that has a particular uh, ability to understand arts and culture and creative enterprise is yet another kind of hurdle. And so that's been an important part of our process. And we do have a sort of carve out of roughly 8% of our corpus for things where we will accept a return straight off for deeper mission uh, alignment. And that would include below market rate things like PRA, PRIs, like some of the things that have been talked about that are not necessarily gonna deliver market rate returns, but have huge value. And so to kind of illustrate that, I'm gonna quickly within my time frame sort of name two things that meet two different kinds of goals. So one is a CDFI. So um, we have provided a half million dollar uh, a very low interest loan to the Colorado Enterprise Fund, uh, CEF, uh, specifically to create a fund within their uh, lending for creative en enterprise businesses, because it was clear they were uh, providing capital to some creative en enterprise businesses, but you wouldn't know that from their website. It was not there was no dedicated area of their website, no fund, no specific trainings, targeting creative on entrepreneurs. So we provided them the capital to uh, not just have that fund, and the fund is in some ways merged with other capital that's not restricted, but it's leveraged enormously. So the amount of lending that they've been doing to creative enterprise businesses goes far beyond the amount of capital that we gave them because they've been able to aggregate capital but it gave them a platform to deliver a message to the entrepreneurial community, uh, particularly BIPOC and women entrepreneurs, that there is capital here for you and there's technical assistance here for you. So that, that was a, a, a very important investment for us um, that allowed us to meet the need of creative entrepreneurs that were not being met through our grant making work. Uh, and then another investment is in something called the Equity Alliance. Um, which is a market rate investment, um, uh, really focused on BIPOC and women uh, venture firms. Um, so it's a fund of funds, although they make many direct investments as well. And I'm mentioning that just because they're not specifically creative enterprise directed, but by the nature of the kinds of investments they're looking for, roughly a third or more of their investments end up in creative enterprise enterprise businesses, in fashion businesses, uh, in food businesses, uh, music businesses. Um, but for us, it ties to our equity values and looking how do we shift capital into the hands of BIPOC and women fund managers, which is a huge issue in our country. The statistics are horrible in that area. Uh, and But it's a market rate investment. But ultimately funds are flowing to creative ent enterprise businesses. So that's considered part of our regular corpus, not part of that 8%. And I'll stop there. Okay. How do you get to the first investment? You know, who drives this? Is this an internal thing, you know, by your boards? Is it, um, you know, does it come from external sources? Um, you know, how do you, how do you start this work? Um, Laura. So we have been an advisor to 25 museums and other cultural institutions to help equip them to have this conversation internally. And uh, we spent some time with the, the executive leadership of the museums and cultural institutions, including the boards, but we spent the majority of our time educating the CFO, the COO, very rarely do cultural institutions have uh, chief investment officers. They simply don't have large enough endowments and they typically have an outsourced chief investment officer or, or an external advisor who plays that role. So it's frequently someone who's trained as a CPA who is staffing the investment committee or is the liaison to the investment function of, of the museum or the cultural institution. And that individual often feels ill-equipped to engage in an investment conversation with the board members and the other um, leaders who are on the board's investment committee, because those folks are typically 50 year experience ma managing directors from Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley or one of these big firms. So we thought it was really important to make sure that that CFO or the COO who was had been hearing about impact investing was curious about it, 
had the information that they needed, including the answers to the frequently asked questions, like, do I give up financial return if I start to invest with my values in mind? How do we get started? How do we look at our investment policy statement differently and integrate values and priorities for our community? Uh, things that are more mission aligned into our investment policy statement. We wanted to be sure that the staff that would be on the front lines of making this change happen, that the staff that was in a position to keep this topic on the meeting agenda, because none of these questions get settled in a single conversation, as Gary can tell you, takes a board and senior staff some period of, of time through multiple conversations, talking to a number of outside experts to uh, coalesce around the idea of doing well and doing good together. Um, so when we surveyed, we did the first ever survey of independent museums of art and design, uh, and we asked them this question, where they were on their impact investing journey, who was playing the key role in encouraging the institution to move in this way. So probably not a surprise, the board and the C-suite with the investment committee sort of in the lead were the primary champions to bring an institution into this change. Um, surprisingly, uh, currently it doesn't appear that donors or the public or artists are asking these questions. We're starting to see that change, uh, particularly as younger people and women have greater control of wealth. We know that younger people and women are real leaders in the impact investing movement, and they're going to start to expect the institutions that they donate to, to reflect the values in their in, in investing that they reflect in their galleries, on their stages, who's on their team, uh, the audiences that they're cultivating, and so on. Uh, so in the short run, it's the C-suite, the board led by the executive committee that seems to uh, lead the way, but I think that it's going to become a much more democratic conversation over time. In the same way we see artists and the public raising important questions to museums and cultural institutions about how they're behaving, I think that those groups of activists don't actually realize that many of these institutions have money that they are stewarding, that they're responsible for, that they can make investment decisions around. Once folks have a greater understanding of cultural institutions and their responsibility managing in the endowment, I think that there will be a higher expectation that cultural institutions will manage their endowments in a particular way. Awesome, great. What do you think, Kate? Do you wanna build on that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I you know, it's so interesting. So Ambitious is really about shifting power, capital and ownership to cultural communities under threat. Um, so, it's a natural outcropping of the work to understand that folks on the ground need more than philanthropic capital. A lot of folks on the ground actually don't want to rely on philanthropy. They want to be, um, you know, they they see themselves as um, folks that can solve their own challenges. And so, and I say that. Um, knowing, having worked inside a large institution, having gone to the um, impact investment committee. Um, <laughs> and let me tell y'all, like, it was kind of scary. It was kind of scary to be in the room with those folks because their definition of risk was really different than the definition of risk that a lot of program officers have, that um, a lot of program folks have. And my biggest asset in those conversations to get a PRI, a program related investment made, was actually an impact investment colleague who believed in it as much as I did. So the ways in which we work with other folks um, that are aligned and that see the value that we see um, as program folks and that we're hearing from the communities who really have the solutions to their um, to their own um, challenges is super um, is super important. But I think that there's this bigger question um, that we need to be asking ourselves. You know, this idea of risk and what are we really afraid of? Laura mentioned that a lot of folks um, are sitting. Um, in those decision-making seats, some of whom come out of 
financial structures that do not see this, the world and um, its solutions the same way that communities see their um, solutions. And so having moments and having um, trusted brokers who can help us ask those questions mm -hmm. is really important. And I would just, I really appreciated Stratton starting us off with this idea of bi-directional. Mm -hmm. This is really something that nobody's, nobody has the playbook for every situation. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna need to get in and um, take some um, take some risks, whatever those, however we define those risks. Um, and we're gonna have to be really transparent about um, the importance of learning because what we're currently doing is not working. Like it's not working. We have to try some new things. Thanks, Kate. Uh, Gary, do you want to add to um, to that topic? Um, we also have a question in the chat that I want to get to. Sure. No, I, I would just say briefly, you know, and it, it'll kind of pick up on on the previous comments. Um, it's an educational process. I mean, uh, foundation boards, and this would include community foundations, tend to uh, be made up of fairly conservative, risk averse, traditional investment world people. Uh, and they view themselves as the sort of protector of the capital and and have this very traditional view that their job is to generate maximum returns, no matter where those returns come from, to fund the good work of the foundation. And so this idea of using that capital in ways that are mission aligned is something that's really alien to them. So I would say anybody that's embarking on this journey, there's usually, it was true for us, and we found ourselves providing kind of informal educational support to other smaller private foundations around the country because of our journey. Um, you have to go through that um, educational process and you have to be patient and you have to, because you can't go faster than the pace of the appetite of your board and the knowledge of your board. So we took a couple of years of having board retreats, bringing in outside speakers. We brought in Laura kind of early in her Upstart collab work. I think we actually brought her in twice. Uh, we actually brought in the leadership of CAST, the Community Arts Stabilization Trust, to give an example of a model. We brought in experts in impact investing from all over the country to, to, to talk to our board. And slowly the board came around. And then as I alluded to, we actually had to change investment firms because mm -hmm. again, we're one of those smaller foundations. We don't have a chief investment officer. We use an outside firm. And so we ended up going through a whole process of bringing in a uh, um, the Blue Rider Group, which is a kind of boutique firm within Morgan Stanley that has a particular focus on working with high net worth individuals, art collectors, museum endowments. So they have a particular interest and knowledge of creative enterprise and 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 that world. And so that was also an important part of our process. So I I would my advice would be kind of patience and the educational process is crucial because so many folks have this perception of impact investing that is 20 or 30 years old. <laughs> you know, that is it they think of them as they they they, they think of it as PRIs. They think of it as returns trade-offs. One in, you know, you know, 1% interest loans or forgivable loans that will turn into grants. So this idea that you can be investing in things that have social good, that are mission aligned, that can actually also generate returns that can fuel your philanthropic work is a concept that's often alien to the folks who sit on investment committees. Yeah, but what a brilliant thought. Uh, <laughs> um Steph, uh, should I do the question in the chat? Yeah, think? we have time for one last question. I, I think we, Daniel has some really great questions, a lot of questions. So let's yeah. do that last question and final thoughts, and okay. we'll send people on their way and let them know about our upcoming okay. events. Okay. So uh, do you feel there's sufficient social infrastructure in the form of things like cultural districts and BIDs to absorb or facilitate capital investments from your philanthropic agencies? Who would like to take that on? I mean, I can start, I guess. Uh, you know, I would say for us, 
at, at least within our community, our cultural districts and bids are for the most part on this journey themselves. They're not set up to necessarily accept investment capital. They don't have that uh, kind of infrastructure. Um, uh, and the bids vary widely. So, and, and often the bids in the cultural districts overlap. Uh, so for example, in, in a, an area called Rhino, which stands for, you know, River North in Denver, um, that uh, they have a bid that is enormously successful because that neighborhood has exploded to the point where a lot of the cultural vibrancy is being sucked out of it uh, because of gentrification and displacement. So our, you know, classic story, artists that got things started are being pushed out, but the bid is a very wealthy bid. So they're able to invest in major cultural festivals and a lot of activity. But again, I don't think they've really yet looked at investment capital as something that they need to fuel their work. They really work with the, the money that comes in from the bid revenue. Uh, here, where we're, we happen to be located in a cultural district, the Santa Fe Arts District, uh, there is not a lot of commercial activity here other than arts and artists and small businesses. And so the bid here is very poorly financed. There's not a lot of bid revenue. So actually we're in a conversation now with a lot of the businesses, the bid itself, uh, uh, the cultural district around, could we create a capital investment fund that could start essentially buying up properties, kind of similar to what the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust did many, many, many years ago to say, okay, let's let's own this problem. And instead of letting the marketplace govern things and have buildings be bought and scraped and artists kicked out and, uh, you know, uh, uh, highly unaffordable properties uh, result, can we actually bring together a pool of foundations and, and other potential investors to actually create a pooled fund where we could start buying up these properties, um, you know, in some ways sort of similar to what CAST has done in yeah. in Oakland. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, Kate, do you wanna talk about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't really, um, I, th I, I, what we're seeing at the national level is a movement of cultural solidarity economic system slash systems. Um, that are nascent and really exciting. Um, and that I think will move us closer to the kind of world we all want to live in. Um, but there are infrastructure gaps, um, you know, beyond bids and cultural districts. Um, there are other larger gaps for um, holding integrated capital, um, for deploying integrated capital at that um, at that scale that a lot of uh, philanthropic capital wants to to do so um, I, ambitious is really thinking about infrastructure especially because we are going to sunset in three years and so thinking about what kinds of investments we can make now so that um, it's a lot easier for solidarity economy work or next economy work or, you know, the work that really is people-centered work um, can get off the ground without the kinds of legal expenses, can handle integrated capital that y'all are um, interested in providing um, in ways that don't, um, don't sink the movement. And that's the thing that we're kind of, it's both like really exciting that integrated capital and, and, um, impact investment capital is coming online and, and at the same time um, it takes a different kind of management um, both on the philanthropic side and on the receiving end mm -hmm. and we just want to make sure the whole that structures are fully equipped um, mm -hmm. so that instead of doing the thing that we really want to do which is like something that philanthropy does a lot um, we end up undermining the movement so okay. larger concerns Thanks, Kate. Yeah. Laura, last word on this one? Yeah, I obviously we all know that it's important for there to be space for people to come together in community and that cultural institutions often host that space. However, I would say that when you think about investing in the creative economy, 
it, it is even more important to think about investing in the businesses that are in these creative industries. These are places that creative people start so they start up these companies, they work at these companies. It's a way to create wealth in the hands of creative people, which then can be used in these new thoughtful ways that Kate was alluding to. Uh, it, it's a type of investment at a scale that uh, is much more suitable for different types of capital. Using things like the honeycomb credit crowdfunding solution is a way that all of us who care about creativity in our communities could feel like we have a stake in making that happen. Uh, and the types of financial returns investors can hope to see investing in companies looks pretty different than the types of returns you can expect to see investing in real estate. So while there need, needs to be real estate at a community level for the future of culture and creativity, that doesn't mean the real estate needs to necessarily be held by single institutions. Uh, and when we're thinking about investing, having big empty spaces and buildings secured for the community that aren't activated, which often is what happens when uh, fiscal support is limited, it goes to the space and then there's nothing happening in the space, that's equally problematic. So I would say, uh, remember to think about the role investing in creative businesses can play in a investment portfolio that's thinking about impact in a community anchored around art and design and culture and heritage and creativity. Fabulous. Great. Back to you, Thank Steph. You. Thank you, everybody. Um, this was a great first panel. Extraordinary, actually. So I can't wait to go back and listen to it myself. Um, if you're new to everything we're doing, um, we have a housing webinar coming up. And then we're going to be in person at Essex County. And these are uh, two of the events are for investor trainings. So on Mar May 21st, we have the Arts, Culture, and Creative Economy Financial Innovation One Day Course. Um, we have a Housing One Day Course, same uh, idea on May 22nd for investors. And then on May 23rd, um, we're inviting the nonprofits and the projects and, non and small businesses, startups, and co-ops to come together for our social venture education day and think of it as a farmer's market. So if you're in or want to come to the Boston area, we'll be in Essex County. We hope you can join us in person May 21st through May 23rd. Thank you again for um, all of our speakers. Karen, you did a great job on the moderation and we're super excited. Reach out to uh, Stratton, Karen, myself, uh, Alexis on our team, if we have any questions for you. We hope to see you very soon and um, thank you again. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank all the speakers. Thank Steph. Thanks, Karen. Please join us in May if you can and reach out to us if you have any questions or concerns as we continue this journey of uh, building a robust um, impact investing uh, ecosystem here in Essex County. Thank you all very much. Thank you.